I didn't know I had a Bithnik on my team. There she is. She's right there. So Bernadette is, is with me at the Department of Ed. And it's funny, um, Lisa was talking about yes and. And she goes, oh, Bernadette must have taught you that. And I was thinking, that's cool. You never told me that. This was a yes and as well. Um, yes and was one of the things we practiced at Apple to just, you know, the plussing, the how it came from working with Rebecca Stockley, who was a, an improvisational storyteller, who used to say, you know, we, she worked with uh, Randy Nelson, who was the dean of Pixar University. And their job was to try to get 200 animators to tell a story together. So there you go. That's what you'll be doing, telling stories together. And I wish I could stay the whole time, because this seems incredibly fun. But thank you, Lisa. Thank you for your work. And um, thanks for all of you for being here. So I'm going to do kind of three things. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about kind of what's happening in, uh, in Washington and the, the way that we're thinking about learning, OK? about learning, the kinds of things we're talking about, specifically with how technology can kind of power up the learning environment. I'm going to tell you about three projects we have and just kind of maybe model a little bit of the design thinking that we've used to kind of think about a problem and try to come up with something that we could do to potentially solve them, and then close with just a few ideas for thinking about the design challenges that you'll be, you'll be working on. So, uh, so here we go. So first of all, just think in your mind. You wake up in the morning. You have to learn something new. What do you do? How do you learn today? Anybody? Wikipedia. Google. You, you Google it. You go to Wikipedia. What else? Twitter. Twitter. Ask, my wife. Ask your wife. <laughs> what else? Seek out an expert. Find an expert, networking, phone a friend, etc. Yeah, so when you think about this, like when we, when we struggle about how we teach kids and how we set up learning environments, one of the most fundamental things today is to say, Adults, everybody, when you wake up in the morning, you have to learn something new, what do you do? And start with kind of that fundamental uh, remembering that we are all learners every single day. So there you go. So that's kind of the start. So we, uh, first thing I had to do when I got to Washington was publish the, the National Education Technology Plan. And, and Bernadette and the team had, thank you. <laughs> Bernadette, <laughs> Bern, have you read it? It's a hundred plus pages. Somebody did tell me it was a page turner. So there you go. <laughs> Read those pages. There is an executive summary. But the National Education Technology Plan purposefully was titled like this with learning in big letters because it was really a, a, a story, a treatise about how we can transform the American education system by powering it up with technology. But it was definitely about learning powered by technology. Focus on learning. Start with learning. Um, et cetera. In this plan, we talk about you know, connecting informal and formal learning environments, in school, out of school. How do we make sure everybody has what they need to learn every single day? Right? How do we make sure learning is personal and it's, and it's focused on my interests and what I need to learn and how I think about those kinds of things? It's focused on you know, connecting with other people who can help me and the like. It's focused on assessments, but it's assessment for learning, the kinds of things that provide you as a learner, you as a teacher, you as an administrator, whatever your job is, whatever you're doing, you as a parent. It helps you have the information that you need so that you can continue to make the best possible decisions for your students. It focuses on teaching, this notion of the highly connected educator, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but connected to the tools, data, resources, content, to the experts, to the peers, to whoever can help you in your teaching practice. And then it kind of talks about the infrastructure. What do we have to have in place to actually make this happen? A lot of talk in Washington right now about infrastructure. I promise we won't talk about that. This is not a coffee keynote. This is a wine keynote. So after dinner, you got to kind of lighten it up just a little bit. So we won't talk about infrastructure, but we could. OK. So the, um, what's been interesting is you know, a lot of people will kind of wring their hands and say, you know, we've been having, we have had technology a long time, or we bought a bunch of whiteboards and nobody uses them, or we've, you know, we remember when the things were in the closet, or, you know, our teachers don't know how to turn on iPads, or whatever. A lot of sort of crazy things. That's a crazy sentence I actually have heard. Um, but so we're kind of saying, though, that this is kind of education's internet moment. And we say that by what has changed? Like, what is this point in time? Where are we right now? And how is this opportunity to learn vastly improving because we have a couple things going on? First, it's mobile technologies. I've been in Washington for three years. And it was after I got to Washington that the, the tablets kind of first kind of hit the, hit the scene. So when you think about that, that's a very short window. So mobile technologies, the kinds of things that are in the backpacks of students, in, in people's hands, smartphones, these, these, the, all of these devices that allow you to 
not have to just wonder about something, whether you're at a dinner party or in a classroom. You can Google it, you can find out, you can check things out on the fly. The second is this notion of social interactions for learning. The places that you can go, connect with people, hang out with people, have conversations, share resources, share videos, share explanations, all sorts of kinds of things, collaborate on projects together. These social interactions online, we can absolutely leverage these kinds of things for learning. And that's something that we're seeing happen as we speak. Third, the proliferation of digital content. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is something that right now is kind of, kind of taking off. And ISKME and, and Lisa in particular, and, and lots of you in this room are likely very, are leaders in the whole open education resource movement. But this notion that digital content, the kind of content that's really helpful for lots of people in many learning environments is becoming more and more available. It's, it's proliferating, it's, it's everywhere. Um, digital content and, and the advancements in digital content are actually what make me think that that's a really good use of those textbooks. <laughs> and finally, big data. So the kind of data that can actually give you the information that you need when and where you need it. This is something that is, we, again, I don't think we'll talk a lot about big data here, but it's something that's, that is changing the way that we're thinking about learning. If we, in fact, can move from this notion of data-driven decision-making, which you know, starts with, we have a lot of data, and I'm like, what are you going to do with that data? We're going to spend two days teaching teachers how to analyze that data. And I'm like, that's not that helpful. So if you know what to do with it, if you know how to analyze it, then create the tools and resources that actually give you, take it to the next level, give you the recommendations. We don't want Amazon to say, you know, here's all our raw data, but everybody else purchased, you know, go, good luck. Let's teach you how to analyze that data so you can see what might be helpful to you. Instead, they give you recommendations about what possibly uh, you could use um, and what other people like you might have liked. So this notion of using big data to help us learn more about how people learn, about how individuals react, about the kinds of things that will help every single learner continue on their learning progression. Big data is a big deal, and we're really interested in this. Somebody said the other day, you know, it has been location, 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 and now it's data, data, data. OK, so Secretary Duncan last February actually to a national audience, said we need to transition to digital learning in the next few years. So he doesn't say things lightly, right? And so it's kind of like we need to think about, so why, why, are, why are we thinking about this? Why are we thinking about this transition from a predominantly print-based classroom and print-based learning environment to a digital learning environment? And by the way, this is not an either or, right? Well before the printing press, we could learn from people storytelling and the like. We still can do that, even though printing press came along. And if you could learn how to read, right? The, the point was learning to read, so that you not only could learn from people, but you also could learn from books. And now, you can still learn from people. You can still learn from books. But there's this new digital learning environment that's providing all kinds of affordances that we never had before. And when you think about it, it's only, it is less than 20 years old less than 20 years ago that we started having kind of internet to the desktop. Significant. It is significant. It is education's internet moment as we speak. So why digital? So when Secretary Duncan says something like that, many people, as you can imagine, ask him, like, what are you talking about? There are all these barriers, all these reasons that we, we can't do this. But the, the fact is that we have to figure out how to get many more learners over a much higher bar. We have 93 million adults in this country who are undereducated. They need to learn. They need to wake up in the morning, have the opportunity to learn something new. We have about a 20% success rate with community college students who actually end up getting a degree. We have got to figure out how to get many more students over a higher bar. You know the statistics with dropouts. You know the statistics with the, with the um, the number of students who need remedial help once they get to college. These are all the kinds of things that we're struggling with. So when you think about this, what are the kinds of things that digital can help us with? And I give you these mostly just to say, you all know these, but I will tell you that this is the kind of thing that's really helpful 
for me as I talk to reporters, as I talk to school board members, whoever it is, and they're going, you know, why technology? Is it just, you know, shiny objects and kids love technology? I'm like, no, it's not that. It is that you can fundamentally alter and transform the learning environment because of a few of these things. And there's, there's more than this, but this is kind of a helpful list. When you begin to use technology in digital learning environments, you can increase the feedback to the students, to the teachers, to the parents. You can get these kind of rapid feedback loops. Students don't have to wait for the teacher to grade their paper. They can begin to get some feedback in other ways online. The, the ability to integrate animations and simulations to find explanations of concept, complex concepts from experts and other people. The ability to create models of big data sets and, and, and look at things in, in a lot of different kinds of ways. Access to experts of all kinds, whatever you're interested in. Primary source documents. Complete courses. The ability to publish to a much wider audience. You know, we talk about students bringing their paper home and sticking it on the refrigerator, right? The audience of whoever happens to be wandering by the refrigerator. But students can publish to a much wider audience. You all can publish to a much wider audience. Accessibility. We could talk all night just about the, the really amazing opportunities. I had a, a father of a 15-year-old boy the other day tell me that he could, for the first time in this child's life, child was autistic, for the first time could communicate, was beginning to communicate because the student had this augmented uh, communication system now within, on, his, on a tablet. So the student could begin to communicate what he was thinking and feeling because he had this device. The kinds of accessibility features that allow text on a screen to read to you. That's created for people who are blind, but incredibly helpful if you're learning new material, if you're learning a language, if, if you're you know, tired, if you just want to hear it read. If you want to listen to your own email before you send it, it's a complex, you know, it's a little touchy subject or something. The, the practice of listening to and having it read to you before you send it is actually really helpful. So these are the kinds of technologies, and we could go on and on about all the accessibility technologies that are built in to uh, various operating systems and devices. There's so much talk about time, time and learning, and how we extend the learning time, extend the school day. And what I know is students who have technology at home, their day actually is extended. They're able to go home, they can continue, they can work on other kinds of things, they can get information, they can do their work. Lots of opportunities. For students who don't have technology when they leave, they're still learning, but they, they may be learning in different ways and they don't have those same kinds of advantages. So the ability to take technology and extend what's happening assign different kinds of things that students can be doing because they now have access. This whole notion of flipping the classroom and doing, you know, watching the lectures, watching these things at home and coming in and having discussions. And finally, and it sounds simple, but we always forget about this, that every single person has access to professional tools. I was working with the John Lettett Education Bus recently um, at a school over in, in Redwood City and these students were composing a music video. And they were using, you know, they had a tablet and they were recording the tracks and laying them down and such. And they thought they were just using this kind of dumbed down version. And then there were some folks from the uh, Black Eyed Peas there. And they were like, no, this is what we use. This is exactly how we record music on this bus. They were like, really? It's these professional tools in the hands of, of mere mortals, as they say. So there you go. So there's just a quick list. Hopefully it's helpful at, in, at some level. But the bottom line is we have this ability now to personalize learning. Personalized learning. So what do we mean by personalized learning? A lot of times we've talked about individualized learning, going at your own pace and that kind of thing. But we want people to know personalized learning is not just about going at your own pace because people picture headphones and they think no socialization, no participation, et cetera. So it's more than that. It's also being able to differentiate and provide different kinds of interventions, different kinds of strategies, and try a lots of different things, because now your stack of interventions with your textbook and supplemental materials isn't a stack this high, it's the entire internet and lots of opportunities inherent in that. And finally, it's also wrapping in personal experience, language, preferences, prior uh, stories, family history, who you are as a community member, what's happening, just this whole kind of who you are as a person, the ability to wrap these kinds of things in. 
A lot of work on badges right now that you might be familiar with, and, and a lot of that is also giving relevance to the kinds of things that students do outside of school. So really interesting. So this all kind of adds up to this notion of personalized learning, and we outlined that in the National Ed Tech Plan. And the Race to the Top District, by the way, is all about personalizing learning. So this, late, this last several months, about, you know, I think it was maybe last April or something, that this whole new notion of MOOCs hit, um, hit the sort of, I would say mainstream, but I'm sure it's sort of inside baseball mainstream, the, this, these massively open online courses. If you don't know the history, you, know, you, can, you can Google uh, Sebastian Thrun and hit the story with Udacity, and that kind of gives you a good sense. But what we're seeing is these colleges and universities now creating these courses, putting them up online, right? So whether it's Udacity, Coursera is another one, and they're doing some really interesting work thinking about peer review and how you take, if you have 100,000 students in a class, you better figure out how you're gonna create assessments and feedback loops that include more than the teacher, to state the obvious. Um, Khan Academy, right? He's had, he, it's not really the notion of a MOOC, but this ability to have lots of um, information and ability to learn online. And edX with Harvard and MIT and many other universities getting involved in that one as well. So these are the kinds of things that are, are pretty interesting, changing the way that, changing the opportunity to learn. So if you have access, the ability to take any of these courses. How many have taken a course from Coursera or Udacity or edX or any of those. So just a few of you, and, and Lisa, I would bet that next year when you ask that, I think you'll probably have, have some more. There's a woman in my office taking you know, some courses. She wants to go to business school, so she's taking finance, and you know, just to get ahead. Just I don't know why she's doing it, but she just wants to learn. So there you go. And then, of course, P2PU, um, the ability not just to learn from these kind of high-end teachers at Ivy League schools, but also learn from your peers. What do you have to teach? Other people are probably interested in learning that. And this whole notion of badging. So there you go. That's kind of a, a run through of how we're thinking about technology at a very high level. We're integrating it into all of the projects and programs and things that we're doing. So let me tell you about three projects that we have that we've been working on. Um, we have several more, and I You'll be thankful that I took them all out. I said, yes, we'll just pick three. So the first one is this notion of the Connected Educator Project. So the design challenge was, we know that there are lots of opportunities to learn online. We also know that we spend about $2.5 billion out of federal government money on professional development. We also know that we don't really know if we get much for that money that is spent. And for those of you who are in schools, you can think of the in-service days and maybe what someone bought and someone brought somebody in or you know, lots of different kinds of things. And we started thinking, you know, how people learn has to do, again, with personalizing learning and making sure that it's relevant. It helps you as an educator with a, with a challenge that you have in your classroom. Helps you protect your, perfect your practice. So we started thinking about this. And the National Education Technology Plan had a whole chapter on teaching, and it was all about the highly connected educator. So we decided to do a project, a research project, research slash practice, more like design-based research, where we wanted to see what would happen if we began to spotlight the kinds of things and the kinds of ways that people can learn together online when they're given the opportunity. So just to give you one example, in August we decided we would say August is Connected Educator Month. So Arnie, in a, in a talk in June, announced this. He said August will be Connected Educator Month. That was helpful because then we can quote him and Secretary Duncan says it and there you go. Very helpful. So we launched this and for a month had over 150 organizations all participate with us to create opportunities to learn all sorts of things online connected to education. So there were prizes and challenges and games. There were book talks, right? There were, there were book clubs going on. There were forums and webinars. And lots of organizations just put something up and they would, they would put it on the calendars. We had one comprehensive calendar. At the end of the day, we estimated there was about 90,000 hours just in August alone of professional development that we were aware of that was freely taken, freely, freely given, freely taken. 
So we know that there's an opportunity to learn. We know what people would like to learn. And so how do we continue to perfect that? And how do we begin to make it easier to find the things that people need and give relevance, credence, and credit, so to speak, to the, to the opportunity to learn together online? So that's one project. One of the things that I want to just mention, and I don't expect you to read this, um, but I, this is just something that if this is you know, online somewhere, you can actually take a look at this. When we talk about professional development for teachers, it's, it's actually really helpful to start taking it apart. Because as I said, I did have somebody say, yeah, our teachers don't even know how to turn on iPads. And I said, you know, I really don't think that's true. Like, really think about this. So there are a lot of these kind of myths about teachers and technology that have been around for a long time. So I started saying, and part of it is this age thing, right? Our older teachers can't use technology, or you know, the younger teachers are coming in you know, and it's just second nature. The whole notion of digital immigrants and digital natives is kind of a tired you know, way of thinking about this. So what we really need to do is just take it apart in three buckets. First of all, as a, as a, as a college-educated, uh, literate adult, you are a teacher. How do you use technology in your personal life? Do you shop online? Do you keep track of your children? Do you use Facebook? Have you, you know, think of all the different ways that people connect together online. And likely, I bet the vast majority of teachers are actually good at that and actually have gotten better in the last couple of years and using technology for, them, for themselves outside of, outside of school. So you take that apart and you go, oh, OK, so yeah. Teachers actually do know how to use technology. That's number one. Then you say, OK, as a professional educator, how to use technology? Can you, you know, find resources for your classroom? Can you connect with someone? Do you listen to TED Talks or to any of the other kind of explanations? Do you bring in some of these things to your classroom so that your students can, can have access? What are all the things that you do as a professional educator? And you'll probably find that many teachers, if not all, have something that they do for themselves as a professional that furthers their professional life. So then the third one is what I actually picture you guys kind of thinking about. And that is, so, so if we can set aside those two things and say, so now, as professional educators, we have the opportunity to completely rethink the kinds of interactions we have with our students. What are the assignments? They aren't read pages 1 through 10 and answer these questions, because that's just dumb. So what are the new assignments? What are the challenge prog uh, projects? What are the kinds of relevant, real things that you can begin engaging your students with? I was sitting by teacher from DC over here. Tell me your first name again. Peter. Peter. I was sitting by Peter, at, at, and he said, you know, he teaches DC hist Washington, DC history. So he said, he has his students lead the field trips around DC, and they come up with all sorts of really interesting places to take the class on these field trips. Great idea. The point is, teachers don't have to do all the work, because a student, as soon as students have resources in their hands as learners, and you can begin to engage them differently, teachers don't have to do all the work. It's really an interesting shift. Students can find the resources. They can do the research. They can, they can do design work if we can figure out how to get them engaged in that. So that third bucket is completely worthy of professional development dollars, of professional development time. How do we rethink the kinds of things we're doing with students to en better engage them, create more relevance, and uh, new designs of, of better learning environments powered by technology? So there you go. It's about attitude and not, and, uh, not age. OK, that was number one. Second project is the Education Data Initiative. OK, so this is kind of an interesting one because it's as Todd Park, who, is the, who has the cool title of being the CTO of the United States of America, as he talks, we want to liberate the data, liberate the education data. And we also want to rigorously pr uh, protect privacy. So I just want to put that out there. We're definitely interested in protecting privacy, but we want to liberate the data, make data available, and help people understand the ways it can be used. So let me kind of talk about a few of these kinds of things. So it comes from a long history of government providing data, right? So somebody recently said, well, you know, if we have the Weather Channel, channel do we need the national oceanographic and atmospheric administration, NOAA. 
Do we, do we still need that if we have the Weather Channel? Well, the point is, the Weather Channel and the entire industry of everything to do with weather is all because all this NOAA data, all the weather data is free and publicly available. So people can do all sorts of interesting things with it. Same thing with GPS data, the global positioning system data. That's all government data that they've made publicly available so that the entire, all of these industries and jobs and cool devices and opportunities have sprung up around this data. So I don't think in education we have anything quite as cool as weather and positioning system data. But we started thinking about what kind of data do we have. Oh, I'm sorry, one more example. This wind, the wind map. This is an example of, I just put this in here because this is one of my favorite uh, uh, sites. It's a visualization website where you can get lots of different examples of big data that's been visualized in different ways. When you look at this online, all of these, all of the, the, it's, it all waves, right? So if you actually looked at San Francisco Bay Area over the last 24 hours, it would have been pretty intense. But you can kind of get the weather patterns, get the, the wind patterns by looking at this, at this map. So if we think about what open education data, what do we have in education? We have three kinds of data. First, a bunch of data that's freely available already. So all our student locator stuff, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into that. Second, we have a bunch of data that we collect as government that's not it, we can't make it publicly available, but we can make it available to, say, qualified researchers. But we've made it very hard to do so many times. It's not machine readable, et cetera. So that's the second kind of data we're interested in working on. Third is a very interesting idea that's about giving data back to the consumer or back to the learner. So if a learner takes a test, if a learner engages in a digital learning environment, there's a lot of data collected. Is it possible to give that data back to the person who actually should own that data? So that's, that's an interesting one. And that we're thinking about this notion of my data downloads. So this came from the, um, this started in, 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 um, with the Veterans Affairs. And they decided that veterans actually should have the rights to their own health data. So they made this available, thinking they'd get maybe 20, 25,000 people that might download their data. As it got up towards a million, they thought, we're on to something. People do want access to their own health data. So in education, we started thinking about the same thing. If we made data available, could we create systems that will help students be smarter about paying off their own student loans or taking loans in the first place? What is the data that we have that we can actually make available to people? back to the person who owns it. Definitely can make personalized learning easier and better. And we also can make transferring schools easier. So if you think about transferring schools, the way it works right now is you walk into the office and say, hey, we're moving to that school you know, in another state. And they go back and they print something out. And they're like, here, you take this move to another state. You walk into the school here, right? It's, it's all paper-based or it might be faxed, or it might be weeks before it actually makes it into any kind of a useful system. But if we, in fact, could, have, could say that every parent of an underage student or every student has the rights to their own data, this would change. This would change the ability for people to take their own data and do something with it. We also could begin to see a lot of other kinds of applications spring up around this. So it might be something that you can think about as you go through the week. What are the kinds of data that you can think of that might be helpful to learners, or to you, or to teachers, or to parents, or the like, about learning? OK, number three, project number three, the Learning Registry. How many people have heard of the Learning Registry? About 10 of you. OK, there you go. Learning Registry, this was based on the problem when we first got to Washington, we were like, you know, there's so much digital content, but it is all over the place. So we started this project with the Department of Defense. And the, the challenge was to say, just in federal government, we have the National Science Digital Library that was over at NSF, a lot of other education data, education content and lesson plans and, and stuff. Um, at NSF, at NASA, in the National Archives, at the Smithsonian Institute, you know, and on and on and on. Across Washington, D.C., there's a lot of really cool education data, education content. And so we thought, we got to figure out how to, like, how to 
raise the awareness of this, right? So the learning registry was kind of this, this project that sprung up around sharing what we know, and it's what we know about uh, content. So if you're a teacher and you're like, I ought to teach this, you know, this unit on, uh, on Mars, for example, or you know, whatever, you can think of your, your favorite whatever. And you start to look out on the internet, and there's a lot of stuff, but it's all over the place. And what you do is you go to the places you know. You might go to Khan Academy, you might go to Smithsonian or NASA, Thinkfinity, Brokers of Expertise, OER Commons, and the like, right? So you might know to go to those places and do a deep search. That's helpful a little bit, okay? But if what we thought about is if we could create a technology where if everybody who owns content would register their content in this thing called the learning registry, then we could change the way that this works. So if you had a central registry and everybody registered their content, then what you would have is if you're at a computer, you can go to, actually, you can go to any, any portal that you like and you would find the content in that portal and then instead of having to now go over to another portal and another and another and another and find these, you would go to one portal that you like, it would find you what's in that portal and then have a list of the other things that are registered in the learning registry. So it would begin to make transparent the places where these things are used. So that's the notion of the learning registry, trying to make the content find the person rather than the person having to go out and find all the content. So this is in, in beta right now. It's, it's been um, worked on with the Department of Def Defense and the Department of Education and with a contract with uh, SRI. Um, this is something anybody can get involved in. It's interesting. It definitely is a problem worthy of solving. I don't know that we've totally nailed it yet. We're definitely still working on it. We're working on a browser that you actually could then go and browse the learning registry. So we're thinking, you know, that's something that would actually be helpful and some other kind of technologies around that. So that was the third problem. And what we think if we can do this is states, right? Everybody's aligning content as we speak to the, to the common core. So if everybody, instead of having to, everybody does it themselves all over again, the learning registry would allow for this content alignment and you could you know, cross state lines, so to speak. Publishers can publish once and, and connect it to the learning registry and then people could find it. Developers could think of all sorts of interesting apps to build. Teachers, again, can both access and share. And researchers can also use data to answer questions like, which of these resources are the most popular and why? And can we figure out what the evidence is that re one resource is better than the next? So there you go. That is the learning registry. So with that, I'm just going to close with one slide here that kind of talks about as you're thinking about design and designing your ideas and thinking about the design principles, which I'm sure you'll be talking about in the coming days, I just thought of a couple things that I, that I would think about if I were able to stay and, and uh, have the opportunity to collaborate with folks. First is focusing on people. Think about the people in your problem or in your, in your project. How do they behave? What do they need? Can you, can you do some, you know, take his page from IDEO's book and do some interviews and, and really watch and think through how people actually react? You should definitely consider basic research and learning theory. So many times, and I see this a lot with entrepreneurs especially, people are creating an app or a, a new, new environment or they're solving some problem and it's based on a problem that they had when they were in school like, you know, they forgot their chemistry book or, or whatever. And what, we're, what we see is we need to get everybody, whether it's practitioners or uh, developers or designers or entrepreneurs, how can we, how can we sh make much more transparent and available base, basic learning research? So it doesn't sound that exciting, but it's really important. If you're thinking about mathematics, how do people learn mathematics? And how do people learn to read or, or develop language and the like? So consider thinking about basic research and learning theory. This is this whole, you know, Wayne Gretzky, you know, you're gonna skate to where the puck is going rather than where it is right now. Thinking into the future is a skill. It's really hard to do. And part of that, you know, I spent 12 years at Apple and part of, you know, Steve Jobs' notion, and it's a little bit different than, you know, 
this notion of focusing on the people, but you know, not running focus groups because he would say that people don't necessarily know, you know what they want. So if you ask them, they may tell you, you know, what it is right now. But if you have to figure out how to kind of do a little bit of future focus, and that's a skill and something that you should consider thinking about. Is this focused a little bit down the path, or is it focused on something right now so we'll, hit, we'll miss the mark when it actually gets completed? And then finally, picking something worthy of your time and talent. This is an amazing group of people. I had an opportunity to, to talk with several of you, and the people that ha have, uh, have uh, uh, come to this amazing place in Half Moon Bay, quite an amazing group of people. Um, that definitely think of something that's absolutely worthy of your time and your talents. So that's designing your big ideas. So finally, what we're trying to do and what Secretary Duncan and the rest of us at the Department of Education every single day think about is how can we vastly improve the opportunity to learn for every single American? What are the strategies? What are the tools? What are the resources? What do we have at our disposal? How can we really design this opportunity and make sure that every single American has access to this every day? And with that, President Obama, great quote, education is a moral obligation an economic imperative. I think others have also added it's a, a matter of even national security, and we're in a fight for the future. And it is absolutely imperative that we get education right. We need to vastly improve that opportunity to learn. So with that, I thank you very much for your time.